Welcome to this evening. This evening is an evening with the London Society, that's where you're tuned into, and the event is Soho Unplugged, and it's about the music scene in Soho across the ages, mainly 20th century, and maybe a little bit beyond. Uh, for anyone who's new to London Society, this is for all who love London. And the aim of the London Society is to translate and bring clarity to complex issues that impact on our build environment. And ultimately, the people who live and work in London, there will be many here tonight. So to find out more, if you are new to it, do go to thelondonsociety.org.uk. But who am I? I am Joe Kendall. I'm your chair. I'm the associate editor at Prog Magazine. And I'm a contributor as a journalist to Classic Rock, Record Collector and Electronic Sound. And I'm also media and business lecturer at BIM London. And you might hear me occasionally on Radio 5 Live and on certain music podcasts too. But tonight I'm going to attempt to marshal three brilliant guests who are just here. You can see them and they have presentations for us as well. Uh, so firstly, we have Peter Watts. So Peter is an author and a freelance journalist who writes about London, music and architecture, among other subjects, and a former Time Out Features writer. He now works for a variety of publications, including The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, Uncut Magazine, and in 2016, he wrote the first biography of Battersea Power Station. Well done. Let's welcome Peter. Good to see you. Excellent. Next up, we have Robert Sellers. So Robert is a freelance journalist and author, his books include the authorised biographies of Ernie Wise. It's, it's a crack, cracking lineup that we've got here. Ernie Wise, Kenny Everett, Oliver Reed, alongside the histories of Ealing Studios, Radio One, and Handmade Films. And he's the best selling author of Hellraisers, A Life in Inebriated Times of Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, and Oliver Reed. Wow. His forthcoming books are a celebration of the Pink Panther movies and British musicals of the 1980s. Welcome, Robert, good to see you, lovely. And then finally, we have Nick Pendleton. And Nick is the only child of Barbara and Harold Pendleton, and his early memories, earliest memories are of kitchen table conversations about the Marquee Club and the Reading Festival. The offices above the club also doubled as his creche, and his many babysitters including jo included John Anderson of Yes, I'm very impressed as a member of Prog Magazine there, it's fantastic. So after graduating with a degree in economics from Nottingham, Nick moved away from the sharp operators in the music business and found, as his dad had warned him, there were just as many in supposedly respectable business wearing, businesses wearing suits. He went on to work at Aviva, uh, Santander, Ernst & Young, BT and Royal Mail, where he was the director of strategy and innovation. And today, Nick runs Ford Strategy Associates, is the chairman and owner of design company, design and event production company, Chameleon Live, and also chairs Entex Sound and Light, the UK's first ever music production company, which 54 years young, is a proud legacy of the marquee empire that his parents built. So well done, everyone. We're here, we're here. And we have now 50 people in the house. Fantastic. Good to see you all. Okay, so um, anybody who's here, you are at liberty to ask a question of uh, our esteemed panel here and you just need to go into the Q&A function. I've got that open now. I'll be looking out for your questions and we'll have questions from the floor a bit later. But what we're going to do, we're going to start with, with Peter. So hello to Peter again. And Peter does have a slightly, slightly up and down internet connection. So he may we may lose him. If we do, we'll try and magic him back. But Peter is going to take us through uh, a little bit about uh, Denmark Street, but before you hit play, why Denmark Street, Peter? Well, I'm making a book about Denmark Street. Um, it should be out pretty soon, so it's been sort of, you know, something that I've been thinking about for a few years. Um, I mean, why Denmark Street in terms of that street? Um, that's part of the presentation, I guess, but it's sort of, you know, the, the historic music street of London. Superb. All right. Oh. We've got a special Ooh. guest. <laughs> okay. I didn't know you were in Cats the Musical because I know that Pete, Nick's got a cat as well. Okay, Peter, do you want to go for it? Let's have a look at your presentation. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. I'll get going on a second. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me just get my presentation going. Right. Here we go. So, Denmark Street, this is a 
picture of Denmark Street from probably about 2010, I reckon, 2011. Um, Denmark Street, for those of you who don't know it, it's on a Charing Cross Road. It's sort of on the right hand side. It's not technically in Soho. I know this is all about Soho music, but Denmark Street's actually in St. Giles, but it's kind of part of the wider Soho um, concept. And Denmark Street has been a music street for more than 100 years, since pretty just before the First World War. Um, nowadays, most people will know it from the instrument shops that you find on Denmark Street. Um, but over the years, there's been a lot more than that. There's been, uh, you know, songwriters, there's been uh, cafes, there's been studios, there's been pub music publishers, there's been rehearsal spaces. Pretty much almost anything to do with music has at some time or other been in Denmark Street. And that means pretty much everybody involved in music has been in Denmark Street, uh, most of the big bands. And I'm not going to talk about any of them. So I'm not going to talk about the Rolling Stones, who were photographed here outside number seven, um, the Tin Pan Alley Club, later owned by a, um, an associate of the, the craze, actually. Um, and they recorded their first album at number four, but I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about this chap, David Bowie. David Bowie spent so much time on Denmark Street in the 60s that when some American tourists were um, was sort of wandering through London with their camcorder, um they just were shooting some random footage they happened to catch uh david bowie on his way to the Giacondo cafe at number nine where he spent an awful lot of time trying to get work I'm not going to talk about the sex pistols who for a long time uh were based at number six rehearsing here's a great picture by bob gruen of them they recorded i think the demos for their first album there but i'm not going to talk about them no i'm going to talk about this guy his name is lawrence wright and he is also known as Horatio Nichols. That was his um, that was his recording, his writing name when he was writing songs. And music and Denmark Street, um, it's all to do with Lawrence Wright. It wouldn't have happened without him. He is the man who kind of first came on to Denmark Street to to, to work there as in, in the music business. And he brought in a lot of the things that we now associate with the music business. He introduced them um here we see on the right some of the great songs that he wrote or published songs that will live forever it says and um yeah as you can see apart from yes we have no bananas i'm not sure any of them have loved live forever um but you know he he created music on on the street he he, he created for all the other three bands we've just sort of seen none of them would have been on Denmark so if it wasn't for lawrence wright and it all began, I'm afraid to say, with a disaster, um, the Whitehaven Pit disaster, which took place in the in the north. Um, I think 130 people died, and this was um, this caused a lot of you know a, 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 lot, a lot of a lot of angst across the country, as you can imagine. Now, Lawrence Wright at the time was a um, a publisher. He was a songwriter, and he was a publisher. That meant he would buy other people's songs and sell the sheet music so people could play it. He had a, he owned a song called "Don't Go Down in the Mine, Dad," um, and he was selling that in his office in Leicester. You can hopefully see his, the address here. That's where he used to work. Um, after the Whitehaven Pit disaster, this song became hugely popular. He sold, um, I think, sort of like a million copies of the sheet music. He gave the proceeds, some of the proceeds, to the to, to the mine relief fund, and the rest of it um, he used to move to Denmark Street. This is Wright House, which is the office that he had after the First World War. He moved down there in 1911, originally at number eight, but he moved to number 19 um, as he sort of got bigger and bigger. And I guess to understand, well, first of all, okay, let's look, let's look at this. Um, this is Tin Pan Alley. So that's the other name people give to Denmark Street. They call it Tin Pan Alley. And this is the Tin Pan Alley, the original one in New York, 28th Street. It's where um, all the music writers um, lived, like Irving Berlin and George Gershwin. They, they, they were all working from these offices at Tin Pan Alley. Um, they say that it was called Tin Pan Alley for a variety of reasons, but presumably it's just because of the amount of noise that was coming out of the various um, songwriting spaces there. People bashing away at the pianos. People would have said it sounds like Tin Pan Alley, and that's the name. We then inherited the name over in, in, in London, and it also came to represent to, to sort of um, signify a certain type of music. 
um a sort of you know sort of sort of sentimental sort of quite schmaltzy ballads sometimes quite bawdy musical stuff but generally the more sentimental love songs that was a tin pan alley style um and that was a sort of music that, that Lawrence Wright um was writing as Horatio Nichols and also that he was um that he was buying off other songwriters as a music publisher um here are some of his some of the books you can get an idea of the amount of songs that he was buying and you get to really understand what music publishing meant in those days. Um, you know, sort of this was this was before sort of widespread radio, certainly before records. So most people, if they wanted to hear music, they needed to hear it live. Um, that meant you needed to, and if you wanted to hear it in your house, you need to be able to play it. So most houses had a piano, or most pubs certainly had a piano. They were everywhere. That was how people listened to music. And if you wanted to listen to a popular song of the day, then you needed to have sheet music to, 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 to play it. That's literally what publishing music publishing meant. It meant publishing the sheet music. And the reason they were sort of located in Charing Cross Road is that it was, it was basically a sort of addition to the, to, to the book publishing business. Um, all the bookshops were on Charing Cross Road. So it kind of made sense that you could also buy sheet music just off the Charing Cross Road on Denmark Street. Um, and after Lawrence Wright moved there, lots of other publishers moved there. Um, it's, it's just kind of really fascinating looking at some of these song titles now. And, and you know, so there are so few of these songs now that, that are remembered. Um, but, you know, they, they, these would have been huge. Some of these songs were selling, you know, one million to three million um, copies of cheap music. Um, you know, they were absolutely, absolutely huge. Um, and the way it worked really was the um, the songwriter, the, the publisher was the most important person in, in music. The songwriter would generally have, if they wrote a song, they would then go to a publisher to, to try and to try and sell it. The publisher would then try and find a um, an artist, a musician who would form it for them in the music hall. Uh, they would use pluggers to do that job. And then if the song took off in the music hall, if it was played on the radio even later on, then they would sell loads and loads and loads of copies of the sheet music because everyone would want to have a copy of it themselves. Um, and I've got a couple of quotes here. You've got the first one is Joseph Trabra, who was a songwriter. He wrote 7,000 songs, including Ting Ting, That's How the Bell Goes, and Daddy Wouldn't Buy Me a Bow Wow, which both of those sound quite innocent, but they, these songs often um, sort of uh, contained uh, double entendres, and apparently a bow wow was slang for penis um so quite often these songs weren't quite what they appeared to be um but joseph trabra says what does he say think of a catchy refrain think of the damn silliest words that will rhyme anyhow think of a haunting pretty melody and there you are the fortune of your publisher is made now he doesn't say the fortune of the songwriter is made he says it's the publisher and as you can see on the right here, there's a reason for that. It's because the publisher, as I say, was at the center of everything. And um, this is the sort of an era before record labels. There was the, the, they were essentially doing the job that a record labels would later come to do. This was the, um, and this was the way music was in this country um, and in America, uh, really up until the 50s um, and, and, and beyond. It was starting to change, but it was still, the publisher was the central figure in, in everything. And all the publishers were based on on Denmark Street. Um, this is what um, um, some of some Lawrence Wright's songs were described as. They were described as simple songs for unsophisticated people, which isn't particularly charming, is it? Uh, here are some of the, his biggest numbers. Uh, as you can see, that old-fashioned mother of mine sold three million copies, and the toy drum major sold enough for him to buy a Rolls Royce. Um, Amy was a sort of song that was based on Amy Johnson, so obviously topical songs. I mean, a lot of them are love songs, a lot of them are kind of baldy musical, but then there were also topical songs. The only song he really wrote that I think probably has any sort of um, resonance now is Among My Souvenirs, which has been covered by quite a few artists sort of in the 50s, even up into the 60s, it was being covered by country singers. Um, and then you've got the ones at the end, which I sort of, you know, I love these song titles. Let's have a song about rhubarb. That's actually the correct spelling of the song. And I've never wronged an onion. Who of us have? Um, the other thing Lawrence Wright was brilliant at was publicity stunts. So that song, there was a song previously called Caravan. When, when that came out, he, um, he, he, he rode a camel, I think, or he paid someone else to, to ride a camel through uh, Wimbledon Palais. 
um, when he was uh, uh, promoting um, a song called, or what was it? Oh yeah, yeah, the Amy song. I think he promoted that by flying a plane over Blackpool and dropping sheet music down. He was always trying to find a way to promote the song. Here we hear, here see the way he was trying to pr um, promote how I've never seen a straight banana offering a £10,000 reward to the person who finds a straight banana, um, which apparently did result in boxes and boxes of bananas being sent to um, to Denmark Street. Um, it, but it, this was the kind of stuff that was really helping to elevate these songs and helping Lawrence Wright become an extremely rich man. Um, it was just finding that way of doing it. One of the great publicity stunts he did was to start Melody Maker. He was the guy who founded Melody Maker in 1926, put himself on the cover in that sort of, um, as you can imagine, very sort of um, modest way of his. Um, and Monody Maker was created originally to really to promote the songs owned or written by Lawrence Wright. Um, it, it, it sort of did, it did sort of change quite quickly into being a more general magazine. But, I, you know, I've interviewed Melody Maker journalists even in the 60s, in the early 60s, when Lawrence Wright was still alive. And their, their job was still to do that. Their job was still, what does the, um, you know, what, what, what does Lawrence Wright want? But, you know, th th this, again, was another really important element in, in what made Denmark Street a famous and important a music street. And when NME started, um, in NME originally began as an accordion magazine. But when it sort of relaunched as NME in the 1950s, that was again on Denmark Street. That was at number five. Um, and it was at the enemy that the charts, the first chart was ever published. You know, that was done on Denmark Street, which is probably the single most significant contribution Denmark Street has made beyond the kind of more general uh, contribution to music. This is some of um, his, his, uh, his philosophy. Sorry, I can't say I've got my own picture in my Here we go. So, uh, this is his, his philosophy, not very rock and roll. Drink is bad, smoking is bad, sex is bad. Music is the best substitute. It speaks a universal language. If I speak English or French or German, they can understand. They can understand. But if I play a tune by Schubert or Irving Berlin, the whole world responds. Um, that's, his, that's his philosophy. I don't think it's one that either the Rolling Stones or Sex Pistols or David Bowie would possibly entirely agree with. Um, they'd probably agree with the last bit, though, wouldn't they? Um, by 1964, which is when Lawrence Wright died, he had completely transformed Denmark Street. Um, here we have some of those kind of um, things that followed that followed him onto the street. And I guess here it's important to explain, I guess, why why everything had to locate around Denmark Street. You know, this is sort of pre-internet, quite obviously, pre-telephone, pre-a lot of things. So, you know, people, it was all, it was a very personal business. It was done through personal networks. And, you know, if you're a songwriter and you're publisher and, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're booking agent and the guy who managed the band were all in the same street and you could get a lot more work done. Also, the musicians would have been there. Eventually, the studios were there. You've got Regent Sound Studios where the Rolling Stones recorded their first album. Um, that was there. That was where demos were recorded. So, you know, the songwriter who might have an office somewhere on Denmark Street, write a song and go to a publisher to sell it. They were going to the Giaconda. They would find Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones there. They would send them down to Regent Street to record a demo. And then they would then go and try and sell that demo to, to a record label. That, that was how the music business worked for a very, very long time. The guy on the left side you might recognise in this, Andrew Lou Goldham, who's strolling down um, past right, right House there, looking really rather cool. Um, Lou Goldham loved Denmark Street. He tried to sell a song there about, again, about bananas, I believe, in, um, in, 19, in the 1950s when he was a teenager and then he came back with the Stones and he, he, he kind of really wanted to take over Denmark Street um, with the Stones later on. Um, uh, Lawrence Wright died in 1964 and his music, uh, all the music that he had published that he owned was passed on to this guy, Dick James. Now, Dick James was a singer previously. You can see the song he sung, uh, Robin Hood, that's it on the right. That's the Robin Hood theme tune that most, hopefully some of you will, will, will know. I'm not going to sing it. Um, where that song was produced by George Martin, the, uh, the producer at EMI. And Dick James and George Martin continue to have quite a good relationship. So when George Martin was working with a new band in 1962-3, 
he said to Dick James, do you want to be the publisher? Dick James came up with this like amazing new deal because um, he recognised the talent of them straight away and he signed them up. Um, that band was, of course, Beatles. So Dick James then later acquired um, uh, all of Lawrence Wright's music as well. Um, but it was the Beatles who would completely change this world that uh, that Lawrence Wright had started. And Dick James kind of recognised that immediately. Um, that old world of the publisher and the song and the and the professional songwriter um, was no longer it no longer it no longer could could work in a world in which you know you had the, 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 the these guys who were writing their own songs, performing their own songs. Four of all, you know, three of them could sing. Four of them, you know, they they all had personalities. That world of the publisher and the songwriter was 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 gone. Um, Dick James recognised that that very very early on, um, but. You know, Dick James, his office was around the corner on Charing Cross Road. He looked down Denmark Street. He was still very much part of that world. So even when the Beatles came into music to change it completely, it was still very much a music world that was that was orientated around Denmark Street. Um, and there we go. That's how that's how we leave. There's a very whistle stop tour of the music industry over the first 50 years of the last century. I hope I didn't speak too fast. That was fantastic. Well done, Pete. That was really, it. Yeah, that was lovely. Really good. Very weird. It's very weird speaking into a void. I'm afraid participants out there. Oh no! Really, oh no! We've really... had comments. We've had comments. I'll get to those okay. comments in a second. Oh, good. Okay. Actually, I'll tell you. I'll tell you right now. Tim Barron uh, was first to jump in when you were going through your sheet music to say "Stormy Weather" mm. sunny side of the street is still very much with us. I did recognise some of those songs. That's true. And actually, some of them did get a second wind in the um, uh, in this in the sort of late sixties. People like the Bombs Are Dog Doodah Band would bring back some of these old standards and they would get reworked and they're part of our, the tapestry of pop music, uh, really. You know, uh, but what you're saying about the start of, of publishing and how publishing arose and actually publishers were were good guys. They were one, yes, trying to make some money for themselves, but two, they were trying to protect artists because people were realizing that. You know, if you're going to a pub or you're going to a, um, a restaurant and there's music playing, somebody's sitting there with a string quartet or they're playing the piano, that song has been written by somebody. People are gathering because that, that music is creating an ambience. Can people be recompensed for that? Publishing and licenses were, were part of that. Is that something you go into a little bit with your with your book? Yeah, yeah, and talking about royalties as well, which again sort of didn't really exist um, until sort of you know the sort of publishing, um, the publishers sort of tried to do that. And I talked to Stephen James, I interviewed Stephen James, Dick James's son, and he talked a lot about how you know the different deals and and how le later on what what the beat. The, the deal that Dick James had signed with the Beatles was kind of seen as being, you know, yet another rip-off deal. But at the time, he gave the Beatles unprecedented control that no songwriter had previously had. Um, the other thing that I sort of talk about in the book is, you know, how some songwriters would just, some of them would just sign over the rights straight away for, like, you know, the price of a, of, of a meal. Um, and others were a bit more canny and would hang on to it. Um, and sometimes they could be people who collaborated on the same song, you know, like, you know, the, the guy who'd written the words would just say, fine, you know, I've just had enough to go down the pub again. And the guy who'd written the music would say, no, this this is this is an investment. Um, and I found that quite interesting that, you know, that there was there was there was that going on. I love it. I love it when I come across a piece of old cheap music somewhere, because when I see the cover, it is just like having a single or an album. It's the marketing and it's, mm. it's meant to, to get you towards it. If you don't know the song, I mean, I would be going towards can I find any straight bananas? You know, if you the marketing, actually, that, that's absolutely brilliant. But, yeah, I'd go towards it simply because of the beauty of the, the art that's on it. You know, that was ever thus. Joe East. Hello, Joe. Joe says, you say the publisher was um, in Denmark Street. Did they print on Denmark Street or where was the printing done? Do you know that? I don't know where that's done. That's really interesting. I don't think it would have been done on Denmark Street. Um, I can't imagine there would have been the sort of um, the physical space. But um, I don't know, actually. I'm, I'm going to look into that because there are there are people still around who who who, who remember that world. Another guy I interviewed is um, is Noel Gay's grandson. Um, Noel Gay was a guy who wrote for Lambeth Walk and stuff, and he used to work at Noel Gay in the sixties when he was a boy, a bit like a bit like Nick Nick 
Nick Wood, uh, Nick Pendleton, um, and he remembers packing up the the sheet music that was still being sold by the truckload in the sixties. Um, so he would probably have an idea where it was published. Ah, superb. Okay, so that's TBC, Joe. We'll find that out for you and mm. uh, get Pete to ring him up and let you know. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so thinking about do you, do, when you when you look at Denmark Street, do you go into what was the landscape before the music business settled there? What was happening? If you've got the bookstores on Charing Cross Road, they seem to have been there forever. Mm. I know there was a very Dickens, you know, Dickens wrote about that area quite a lot, didn't he? Mm. Yeah, so I write a bit about the history, I, not so much Denmark Street as much as the St Giles area itself and how it's always had this slightly sort of peculiar kind of no man's land feel. Um, and then a little bit about some of the businesses that were there and some of the some of the occupants of, of, the, of, of the building. Um, there is a blue pack on there. I think like one of the first ever diving suits was um, was 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 invented. In a in a warehouse in a warehouse in a, in a in a in a, in a uh, workshop there, um, and it was exactly it was actually I think I was on number six, which is where the Six Pistols were based, and it was also where Hypnosis, the album cover people, were yeah. based, and one of their ten CC covers for um what is it Deceptive, Deceptive Bends, Bends is um, yeah. someone in in exactly that sort of old fashioned diving suit. Which I'm, I'm sure it is a coincidence. If I was in Sinclair, I would say that's psychogeography. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, of course, you know, Denmark Street, such a lot of talent, such a lot of industry packed into one street. As you say, it develops. We end up with not, not only do we have Melody Maker there, that's fascinating to find out that that was a promotional tool for Lawrence. What a smart guy. Then we've got NME starts up, of course, contributes to, to the charts. Um, and this, this mix, by the time we get to the 60s, do we overrate the importance of Denmark Street in the 60s? Um, no, because it was still important in the 60s, just in a different way, because it was still important because of the studios then. So the publishers were, and, and also quite a lot of those early bands like, you know, the Kinks and the Stones and the Beatles also all signed deals with old fashioned publishers, which they then regretted um, quite quickly. Um, there was still, you know, a lot of the early booking agents were 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 based on there who were doing who were doing tours because the people who were involved in the music industry still gravitated to Denmark Street. So there was, you know, there was the, an office there where you know a load of tours were were, were organised from from loads of big bands. Like people like Hendrix were still going down there. Um, <laughs> And then because you had the studios, you know, the demo studios, mainly region sound, but also Southern Sound and also, um, is it Tempan Alley or Denmark, the Denmark Street Studio, I think on the other side of the road, you still had these as well, which meant that you had musicians on the street because they were playing in demo studios, either as either as either as session guys or they're doing their own recordings, which meant that the instrument shops suddenly appeared on there, which gave another reason for Denmark Street to, to I mean, none of these things needed to, to continue but they kind of one led to another yeah um, it's and it gave it it has given it that consistency which it didn't necessarily need you know that, that's not logical um you know it's not it doesn't need to be there but it kind of has sort of flowed quite seamlessly um up until quite recently well chris butcher asked a question thinking about the 12 bar club etc when did live music mm. come to denmark street yeah, so the 12 bar was really interesting. I write about that um, in the book quite a lot because um, that was originally um, based out of one of the guitar repair shops. There was a guy called Andy, Andy's Guitar Shop. Might be really quite distinctive. Yeah, so what he had, it, there was this forge out the back of, um, of of his, I think his neighbour's place, and they used to use it for like the guitar, the guys who were fixing the guitars would then go and have a little play there in the evening. It was like a social club. Um, and that is what became the 12 bar. Um, I think it began in the early 90s. I think I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was around the early 90s it began. Um, um, maybe in the late 80s as a, as a social club and then sort of more public by the early 90s. Yeah, I, I remember going to the, I, I used to love the 12 bar club and it had a kind of listed chimney because it was a forge and things. It was very, yeah, atmospheric. it's really it's very opened atmospheric. actually. Have, have you, it's just reopened. I don't know if you've been to it. Is it the lower um, third now? Yeah, it's called the lower third. They, they, they couldn't keep the, the, the name because Andy, who, who set it up, owns the name and he wouldn't sell them the name. So they're calling it the lower third after one of Bowie's um, numerous backing bands. 
Oh, wow. Well, exactly. In the lower third, you mentioned the Giaconda there, Bowie recruited the, the lower third in the Giaconda, a lovely little cafe just so they the say. Yeah, that's where I think Flat Iron Steakhouse is there now. So you now you go in yeah. there, and you get like a meal for like twenty five quid. There you could get coffee and a cake for like you know fifty p or something. But uh, and Donovan mm. isn't there. The folk scene was around there. It was and as you mm-hmm. say, we've got Jimmy Page. We've got John Paul Jones. We've got the Kinks there. Uh, you really got me. Was was um, formed on that road. But and lovely landmark I like because you got Regent Sound, Black Sabbath recorded in there and they posed for their first they posed for their first shoot in the graveyard next door didn't they well i am afraid to say that sabbath did record that region sound but not that region sound yeah there was another region sound for off top of tottenham court road oh. further up and i went to a um i went to a press launch of a black sabbath reissue and Tony Iommi was there and he was like, I don't, you know, he goes, I don't recognise it. He's in number, like the basement of number four. It's, and, and everyone's like joking, thinking he's, but he didn't recognise it because Sabbath never recorded there. Oh, I was um, at that as well. But I wasn't sure. Well, I, well, I emailed, I, I, I wanted, I wanted to, you know, there are so many myths about Denmark Street and now that's kind of one of them. So I, um, I, you know, I emailed, um, I found the producer and I said, just, to, you know, just check, you know, which, Den- which region sound was it? And he said, no, it was the other one. It was the one up on Tottenham Court Road. So I'm afraid to say that Sabbath didn't record on Denmark Street. Oh, but they did have their photos taken in the graveyard. They uh, did, yeah. St. St. Giles in the field. So great stuff. Well, I think that we have to move on. I think we have to to move on. Thank you, everybody, for your questions there. Andrew just wanted, Andrew at Humphreys just wanted to say, Lou Golden didn't write about bananas. It was a boomerang. So there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, um, Andrew. Yes, it was a boomerang. It begins with B and it's bent. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Anyway, fascinating stuff. Can't wait to read more. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really, oh, another thing about uh, Denmark Street is uh, when Paul Simon was living in Britain, he went to Mills Music on Denmark Street and they turned down the Sound of Silence. <laughs> classic behavior uh, yeah. in the fraternity there good stuff okay possibly um, while elton john was working there as well yeah that's right so elton and, and bernie were up there around the same time Pat, um yeah. the, the whole the whole gang of them um uh, yeah i mean we know we now know that there's a whole load of stuff going on on Denmark street and um yeah you know there's new stuff stuff has been torn down there could be a bit better historical curation anyway we'll read more in your in your book so that's great okay let us move on to our two prong attack here we have robert and we have nick so uh let's talk about the marquee let's take it away who's going to drive i'll i'll drive and i'll i'll start and uh... Thank you, Nick. First thing we should say that Peter, Peter and ourselves share the same lovely uh, publisher, Paradise Road. Uh, so our, our book was uh, was published and is out now. Peter's is going to be out soon, but his Battersea book is also published by Paraside, Paraside Road. So you can have a look at their website and they, they specialise in, uh, in in London cultural publishing. So uh, we very much thank them for uh, a topic that we're all, I think, interested in. OK, so. Uh, We've got you for 10 minutes each. I'm just going to, myself and then Robert, uh, there's a lot of pictures here because I thought it's a very visual medium. So uh, you don't want to see our faces. Let's let's look at some some pictures. OK, can everyone see the, is that, does that, Joe, Joe does that work OK? Can you see the uh, the slide? It's all good. Cool. <laughs> right. So uh, this is the, this is the cover of the book. Uh, I've named this talk from uh, Barber to Nirvana as a shorthand for the 50 years of music and cultural evolution Robert and I are going to quickly run you through. Um, This is a revolution with London at its heart and a certain club called the Marquee. We tell the tale in our book titled The World's Greatest Music Venue. We will justify this bold claim during the presentation, uh, but don't just take our word for it. So uh, by, by chance, We've luckily, oh, let me get try and get a page down. Ah, by luckily we chose the Melody Maker. Um, so uh, the Melody Maker called it the most important venue in the in the history of pop music. Uh, also, uh, Q Magazine voted the Marquee as the number one in their venue Hall of Fame. Um, pleasingly, five UK venues make the top ten against three from the US. 
But why do we care? Well, um, I think it's the fact that, that music, especially at a young age, connects us so strongly to a tribe, a time, a place, a sensation. Rhythm, after all, is the very essence of uh, life as a heartbeat. And cultural is, culture is, in many ways, the celebration of uh, what it is to be human. And we all remember, don't we, that excitement of being there at the start of something, discovering a new band, a new sound. But most of us were too young to be at the birth of modern music. But the marquee's role in that emergence is, is why this standard, not special building was chosen by Paul Weller as the venue he wanted to meet Pete Townsend for the first time. It's the power that, of music that turns a landfill site in Reading into a mini city once a year. But before Robert outlines some of this musical impact, I'll explain why it was that a time-honoured blend of right time, right place and right person put the club at the centre of a musical revolution. The right person, as we talked about, was Harold Pendleton, a music lover, and among other things, the founder of both the Marquee Club and the Reading Festival. And uh, as Joe said, he was also my dad. So for me, this is a personal story I'm sharing. And uh, here I am on his shoulders on the stage at the Reading Festival, which we always called the Marquee's garden party. So before handing over, I'm going to explain how the marquee got to Wardour Street, which coincides with London's post-war recovery and a revolution in music. And on the way, I highlight three landmark records. Our story starts with my dad arriving in London from Southport, age 24, to start a job in the city and taking a bus from Euston with a request to the bus driver to tell him when, when to get off where the action was. He told him to get off near a jazz record shop on Charing Cross Road, actually just by Tim Pan Alley, where dad found himself looking at records next to his soon to be lifelong friend, trombonist Chris Barber. They went that night to a, uh, a jazz club Soho must have felt like an exciting other world with the explosion of espresso machines, coffee bars and Italian restaurants, so different to the rest of post-war Britain. The Festival Britain and the uh, newly opened Royal Festival Hall at least sort of signalled some post-war optimism. And here we see Princess Elizabeth attending the first jazz concert at the hall organised by the National Jazz Federation. This was a big step for jazz to be seen as respectable. Meanwhile, Harold had moved from playing drums to promoting jazz and managing his friend Chris Barber's band. He soon quit the city, frustrated by the lack of opportunity for the young and the old school culture. In 1952, he set up his first club at Gerrard Street. Club Creole saw the first gig by the newly professional Barber band. After that club closed, due to a raid on its landlord, Pendleton set up a second short-lived Soho club, the London Jazz Centre in Frith Street. This has been named as the UK's first skiffle club. And you can see here Ken Collier on guitar, Lonnie Donegan on banjo and uh, Chris on bass. The following year, Chris secured the barber band and a loose, sorry, uh, Dad secured the barber band and a loose record deal with Decca. To fill up the album, they included some tracks that they termed skiffle. Two years later, one of these songs, Rock Island Line, became a huge hit. And it was named by Q as one of the most influential records of all time and made Lonnie Donegan a star. From listening to that single, over 3,000 DIY bands sprung up over the UK, including this one in London, The Quarry Men. It featured a young Paul and John before it got renamed as the Beatles. By this time, Harold, through luck and timing, become the head of the National Jazz Federation or NJF, transforming the organization to become the main UK promoter of jazz, moving far away from the internally focused talking shop between anarchists like George Melly pictured here and royalists like the Marquis of Donegal. 
From Marquis to a Lord, as jazz was growing in popularity, Lord Montague approached Dad to run the UK's first popular music festival at Bewley. It was a great success, but they disagreed about the direction of travel. So Harold left after the first one. Four years later, he saw the infamous Battle of Bewley live on BBC TV. Meanwhile, Harold, the NGF and Chris were busy fighting other battles, trying to spread jazz throughout the country, but being blocked by watch committees, would you believe, restricting venues that were available for them to play in, while the Musicians' Union were campaigning to stop their efforts to bring over the great jazz and blues men from Chicago and New Orleans. They thankfully preserved, and most famously, they saw Muddy Waters play in 1958 at St Pancras Town Hall where to blues purist horror, he played an electric guitar. You can see it there. The reaction was similar to Dylan witnessed eight years later. But for the young, this was the start of the electric revolution. By now, Pendleton had a growing empire. From his offices in Soho, which moved from Carlisle Street to Soho Square and then Dean Street, the NGF ran hundreds of concerts a year, published a jazz newspaper, called Jazz News, and managed the Barber Net Band, which by now had had UK and US number one hits and regularly toured overseas. It was during a US tour that uh, this picture was taken where Chris Osley and my dad visited Muddy Waters uh, in his club in Chicago, one of the few white people to do so. After this, they replaced the skiffle set in the band with a spot for Alexis Cornier's electric blues guitar. All Harold was missing was a new club. In 1958, this opportunity came to take on a club in the basement of the Academy Cinema in Oxford Street. It was named the marquee after the, lavishly, after the lavish decoration, which included striped wallpaper. The club made its mark with a liberal music policy, catering for both traditional and modern jazz fans, and even Joe Harriet's free jazz that you can see here. A major statement was a residency for the Johnny Dankworth band. Uh, and as you can see on the far left-hand corner, it featured a uh, young Dudley Moore on the piano. In 1960, Harold married my mum, Barbara. You can see the wedding photo here, who worked for him. And here they are with best man, Chris. The ushers included Joe Harriet, Alex Welsh and Roddy Ross. A year later, just a hundred yards from this wedding venue, Pendleton seized a chance to put right the bad reputation Bewley had given jazz and festivals in general by organising his own. While at the marquee, something extra was stirring. Alexis Korn had left the Barber Band and formed Blues Incorporated, the UK's first R&B band. Harold gave them a residency at the marquee, and the second time they played, they had an unexpected boost when Christine Keeler, and Mandy Rice Davis, who at the centre of the Porfono scandal, visited the club, and that generated some publicity. Soon this led to the release of the UK's first R&B album, ironically not recorded at the club, but named after it. And indirectly, the first appearance of a side hustle band formed by those who hung around the band. They had the opportunity to fill in at the marquee when Blues Incorporated couldn't fulfil their weekly slot, due to the opportunity to appear on a BBC radio broadcast. That band was the Rolling Stones. This was the start of a legacy, as the Stones went on to appear at the third and headline the fourth Richmond Festival, and the festival transitioned to rock. And today at Reading, it is recognised as the world's longest running music festival. So at this time, Harold was at the top of his game when suddenly disaster struck. The Academy gave the club six months notice to move out. Again, luck and timing enabled Harold to find a new site in Wardour Street. And after seven years, the club moved with one week's gap to its new home. The home that saw the blossoming of rock. And within a week, the recording of a third milestone album, Five Live Yardbirds, featuring Eric Clapton. So the club now was at the heart of Soho and was ready to play its part as fashion and music 
reawoken and uh, soon became termed as Swinging London. I'll now hand over to Robert to talk you through some of that musical impact we saw at the club. So the gracious can have many criteria. Uh, we came up with a 14 point checklist, but we haven't got time to go through all of them today. So I'm going to focus on the career changing elements of the club for those who played there and attended gigs. It was the site of inspiration for many young performers. For example, Eric Clapton used to come from Ripley and after seeing Blues Incorporated, went back home and asked his grandparents if they could buy him a guitar. Similarly, Phil Collins used to come from Hounslow, chew up and even sometimes help in the club, putting out the chairs to watch the likes of the Yardbirds. Cat Stevens lived locally and was a regular. And Mark Bolan and David Bowie cited the marquee as a place of inspiration. Indeed, Bowie's 1973 covers album, Pin Ups, is a homage to those bands he saw at the club. You also had the Faces, who saw the Who at the marquee and decided to form their own band. It was also a place of opportunity. Manfred Mann was actually a journalist on Harold's newspaper, Jazz News, and expressed a desire to play R&B. His band ended up playing over a hundred times at the marquee. It was also a space to take a risk. Pink Floyd played at the 1966 spontaneous underground happenings at the club and were signed as a result by Pete Jenner, who became their manager, and the rest is history. Similarly, Cream played their first ever concert, even before they had the name, at one of Harold's festivals, then appeared not long after at the marquee. This was a pattern followed by Fleetwood Mac. And you can see here, both Fleetwood Mac and Cream appeared at the club in the same week. It was also a showcase for unknown support acts to make a name for themselves. So Slade, and there was Roxy Music. You had Jimmy Cliff. The Cure headlined with Joy Division supporting. So you certainly got your money on that night. Here's a young Gary Newman with Tubeway Army. Supertramp, way before breakfast in America. And even Howard Jones got signed supporting Marillion. It was also a spot to find the right band members. Charlie Watts was a sought after drummer performing with four bands when the Stones landed him one night at the club. Bowie met Mick Ronson for the very first time, making him one of his spiders from Mars. And a Claptonless Yardbirds found suitable guitar hero replacements in Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck. And the police became a threesome when Andy Summers joined them for a gig at the marquee. And Phil Collins, all grown up now, auditioned and became the drummer for Genesis. It was also a place to try out a name. When the Rolling Stones played their debut marquee gig, they didn't have a name and needed to come up with one fast. Legend has it that Brian Jones had an old Muddy Waters record to hand and that inspired the band to call themselves the Rolling Stones. Jeffro Tull exhausted several names before settling on the one for their breakthrough appearances. And here we have backstage at the marquee, the new Yardbirds getting ready for their first appearance, a band soon to metamorphosize into Led Zeppelin. It was also a site to learn from others. Jimi Hendrix played three famous gigs there, including his debut when the country's top guitarists all sat in the front row, keen to study the American's technique. Here's a picture of 15-year-old Stevie Wonder actually drumming at the club. It was also a space to hang around. Here's the god of Hellfire, Arthur Brown, who used to do a spot of painting and decorating at the club to help out. Well, Banana Rama never actually played the club. Instead, they manned the cloakrooms. Through the famous and sought after club residencies, it was also a place to find your sound. Here is Keith Emerson and the Nice, who started off doing R&B numbers, but by the end of their residency, were at the forefront of the prog rock movement. Also, Brian May studied as a punter the guitar sound of Taste and Rory Gallagher. In fact, hustled his way into Gallagher's dressing room to find out which fuzz pedal he used, then went out and bought it on Denmark Street, 
thus creating the queen sound. It was also a place to find your audience. The Who's legendary 22 week residency saw them going from complete unknowns with scarcely an audience to 60s icons. It was also a place to make an impression. Here are the Sex Pistols outside the club. Indeed, their one and only appearance saw them banned after they thrashed the monitors. The Pistols weren't alone in running afoul of the management. The Stranglers and the Stone Roses were also banned for misdemeanors, usually involving physical destruction. Also making an impression was Adam Ant, who got into a fight with Sid Vicious one night. And Keith Moon, who famously showed up one evening with a dead trout on a lead, which he deposited at the cloakroom. It was also a venue to test your mettle. Genesis nearly broke up, suffering stage fright, sitting in a van at the back of the marquee. Rod Stewart came back many times in many guises before hitting the big time, as did Bowie, going through numerous bands before being signed up by the manager that started him off on his illustrious career. The marquee was a last chance saloon too. take Motorhead, playing one final gig before splitting up, having got nowhere. Luckily that night, they got signed. And the same thing happened to Thin Lizzy. It was also an enabler for growth. So Marillion are probably the best example of a band that started as a support act, went on to headline the club, record at the club's studio, appear at the Reading Festival, then played as headliners at the festival and then became too big to play again at the marquee. You also had conceptual artists like Gilbert and George, who appeared as an interval act at the club and at Harold's Festival. The festival was also the site of Noel Gallagher's unlikely stage debut as the back end of a pantomime cow when he was the guitar roadie for the In Spiral Carpets. You never know where talent lurks. As you've already established, the marquee was a great place to get spotted. Here's Queen's debut album featuring a photograph of Freddie Mercury at the marquee, where they played a number of showcase gigs for prospective record labels. Similarly, Duran Duran got signed there, as did bands such as Free. And looking at that ad, what a memorable week at the marquee that was, with Joe Cocker, Led Zeppelin and The Who all appearing. The Jam also got signed, as did The Pretenders and Iron Maiden. It was also a place to establish and launch your image. This iconic poster heralded The Who's famous marquee residency. The famous Rolling Stones lip logo was used for the very first time on press passes for a specially filmed concert in 1971 at the Marquee. And the Yes logo was originally scrawled on the walls of the dressing room, only to be later rubbed off by anti-prog punk rockers. Even Mark Knopfler first wore his trademark sweatband at the always hot and sticky Marquee. Indeed, the Marquee logo itself, designed by Harold, became an iconic image. It was also a place to end an image. Bowie laid to rest his Ziggy Stardust character, the club for American TV special. It was a place for inspiration and creation. The Spencer Davis group were put in the studio for a day by Island Records to come up with original material and give me some loving was the result. The Who recorded the demo for my generation there, as did Prokhor Harum with the classic Whiter Shade of Pale. A number of hits were recorded at the Marquis's very own studio, including by the first band ever to play there and record there, the Moody Blues with Go Now. Indeed, they came back a few days later to record a promotional film for it, seen by many today as the first ever pop video. Elton John recorded at the studio, as did Toya. The Clash. Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street and Dead or Alive's You Spin Me Round, which started the whole Stock, Aitken and Waterman hit factory era. It wasn't just musicians who used the studio. Monty Python recorded a comedy album there, which helped to break them in America. The Wombles paid a visit. As did the Chelsea football team to record the classic soccer anthem, Blue is the Colour. The studio also hosted the Beatles in 1965, who recorded a Christmas message to their fan club. It was a place to be seen. Wham! shot the pop video for their I'm Your Man single. 
and a place to pay homage. So from the States, you had Simon and Garfunkel come to play the club. Benny King. Here's the Bangles playing the club and Canada's Brian Adams. It was certainly a place for acts from afar to make their name. When you 2 came over from Ireland, the venue they wanted to play was the Marquee. Similarly, Bob Geldof and his Boomtown Rats. Geldof actually fainted on the stage. ACDC from Australia. And then US bands like REM. Here they are in the dressing room. Guns N' Roses played their very first gig outside the States at the Marquee. And famously, Metallica. And here's a selfie of them outside a club. And finally, Nirvana always felt more at home here than in the US. Their final UK concert was at Reading in 1992, which also happened to be the last Reading festival promoted by the Pendleton family. So it was memorable for a lot of reasons. Q Magazine voted that Nirvana performance as the second greatest UK, UK gig ever. So thank you for bearing with us. Uh, you've made it from Barber to Nirvana and hopefully you can see partially why we call the Marquee the world's greatest music venue. Thank you. Well done. That was amazing. That was a tour de force. Thank you so much. Well, funnily enough, you went through quite a lot of uh, artists there. Stuart, quite early on, about three days ago, put a question up that said, uh, oh, Chris Hopkins says I have to run, but it's been really interesting. Thank you. Cheers, Chris. Thanks for coming. See you soon. Uh, so Stuart said, I'd love to know if there's a complete, this might be one for you, Nick. I'd like to know if there's a complete record of the bands who performed at the Marquee when in Wardour Street. I was a member for a few years ago. I remember many, but only a fraction of them. Thanks. So has anyone logged everything? Well, I'm glad you asked that because, uh, again, our uh, our lovely uh, publisher and editor spent a whole summer at the British Library putting together the definitive list of all, all the bands that appeared at the marquee. And uh, to our amazement, we, hadn't we couldn't find an accurate... Um, list before that so um yeah in the book is a list of all the people who appeared and the number of appearances there you go it what this book here you mean the one <laughs> that, now? that one there yes this one right here there you go yeah. so yeah it's it, it's in here as much and in fact given all the stuff that we've had we've had presented everything that that's been put forward and this is something i said to you and robert when we first met i'm surprised it's this this slim of volume because mm. there could have been so much more. Before we get we tackle that, I just want to go to Robert to say, Robert, how did you get involved in this project? Um, well, I'm always sort of on the lookout for um, ideas and subjects to write books about that I can be enthusiastic about because you've got to be if you're going to spend about a year, or in this case, four to five years. Not all the time, I, I hasten to add. Um, doing other things as well but it's got to be a, a subject that enthuses you because that comes through on the page um hopefully enthuses the reader as well if you have that enthusiasm to start with um so um i i think it was just um sort of doing what i usually do when i've got five minutes to spare going on youtube and i think there must have been a sort of a five minute documentary about the marquee and obviously like everybody um we've all got sort of a a basic knowledge of what the marquee was and basically that Jimi Hendrix played there etc the sort of the basic facts um and so the bell went off in my head and said well maybe they'd be interesting um to do a book on it um and I quickly met as I usually do quickly go onto Amazon to see if someone's done it before um which nine times out of ten they have and um this time there, there hadn't been one so this is um, half time coming I was surprised yes yeah, well actually out. In, an interesting thing, the first book I ever wrote was a book, a biography on Sting, which was published by Omnibus. My editor was Chris Charlesworth, and he he he's did, just did a review of the book, saying when as he, he was the editor at, at Chris at Omnibus, he, he was the guy who did all the decision making. And he said that every week he was there almost, somebody came with the idea to do a book on the marquee while he was there, you know, during the 80s and 90s. But they either never came back with a proposal or the, or it was really bad. And so finally one was done. But um, so there you go. So, so I think the appetite out there was 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 there, but um, no one had done it, which surpri was a surprise to me. And obviously getting in touch with the, the people or the person who now owns the yeah. name and put me in touch with Nick, who and I was able to interview Nick's father, had some lovely times going to the house and speaking with Harold and getting his his whole, you know, 
memories of, of that time and putting it down on tape and, and getting it there for for the records so that was that was fantastic so yeah because it's more than the story it. of a venue it's a story of, of Nick's yes, I mean, it's a, yes it's, a, it's a story of a lot of it is the story of Harold the lovely yeah. is that lovely journey that Harold, um Nick says you know he came coming down on London uh, you know getting on the London bus and meeting Chris Barber it's a lovely human story yeah it's amazing really is do you have any memories yourself of the marquee were you rocking around oh, yourself there no because I, I never came to I, I didn't live in London you see I, I, I so later on and it had moved by then I, I went to a couple of times to the Charing Cross one but you know that that that's sort of the McDonald's version of the original marquee isn't it really it's sort of the diet version it wasn't really the real thing um, so no, I never, never, never went there. No. Well, thank goodness there's the sights and the sounds that have been captured through through the ages, uh, from the time that that it that it started. So anyway, and, and also something that I enjoyed, and it, 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 you got there in the end, is the fact that you start with Guns and Roses. Why did you want to start with that kind of bang? Well, because the the um, actually the publisher Andrew's idea, because um, I started it with with Harold getting off the bus at Houston. But then Andrew had this idea of starting it like a Bond film, you know, with a with a pre-credit sequence of I don't know, Bond being pushed off an airplane or something. Start start it with a bang, you know. So so and he thought the Guns and Roses would be a good sort of um, fist in the face opening to the book, which it is. Yeah. You know, it's quite a rock and roll moment. So so yeah, I think it, it makes a, a good a good start to the book. It's yeah. certainly impactful for sure. And I think there might be some people in in this uh, in, at this webinar who this might be their era. I'm not sure. Do you put it into the Q and A. Put it into the comments here if if that's your era. What your, what your memories are of, of the uh, of the marquee. Okay. So well, Nick. This, this is amazing. How do you feel about having this book out that's about your, your, your family and your life as much as anything well, else? As you said, the, um, we were always surprised. We got approached a lot for people going to write a book. And uh, the problem was, I think they were too close to it and, and they just got too um, overwhelmed in the content. And if you're not careful, it, it can be longer than uh, War and Peace or Lord of the Rings. And indeed, it was quite brutal, the editing process or, on, on this book. Um, but but you know in the end I guess we realised if we wanted it done properly we almost had to roll our sleeves up and uh, help so uh, you know we found found Robert and uh, you know we collab collaborated you know, we worked together to get something out there that we could all be proud of and told the the true story but it's not I mean it is a personal story but to be honest it's so many people's stories because actually you know the the marquee was was a place for so many different tribes and for so many different moments and actually i'm as interested almost in the bands that played many times and never made it or the bands who played to support and never made it their stories just as interesting and exciting in some ways as the famous ones that a few that we picked out today so i mean unfortunately we can't we can't feature all of those and there's some great stories that we couldn't even fit into the book maybe maybe a a sequel but uh yeah it's it's so many different people's memories and stories and as we said music is such a personal but shared experience it's uh it's just nice to if if people read it and just relive a little bit of of their past or um the other thing that frustrates me is most of the music documentaries about most of the bands almost pick up after they played the marquee because almost the, the the fuzzy front end of how a band makes it and how they find their band members and how they experiment and build an audience is left out. And for me, that's often the most interesting bit. You don't really want to see, you know, the stadium tours and uh, and indeed when all, no when it's all smoothed out and it's going plain sailing no that's not interesting you want to see the grit that happened before that the yeah. ups and downs i ha take my hat off to your your mum and dad they had um open minds and a great set of ears possibly people coming to them who they were trusted to recommend like you say they didn't get kind of stuck in one genre they 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 moved on they moved with, with the times and in fact the car the, it's shown that the marquee kind of was ahead of the curve, set the curve for, for the times, which is something to be so proud of. For other clubs, that wasn't a given. They seem to be, you know, stuck in a time and place. But you, so, all right, let's talk about you in all of this. When you're growing up, you're growing up with this, right? And it was, as you said earlier, you know, you you had to, uh, various rock and roll and, and uh, pop star babysitters. But um, did you start, did you understand what was going on around you? Did you take this in your stride? Did you ever get starstruck? Not really. I mean, you always take, you always take, 
for granted your own environment, don't you? I mean, looking back at it, how how lucky was I? But um, uh, you you always had to keep it a little bit quiet because otherwise you'd be asked for tickets for everything all the all the time. So it was a little bit a little bit difficult, and and uh, you don't want to be seen to be sort of showing off or anything. So so it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a secret, to be honest. Um, but you know, my most my childhood memories really were. You know, every every holiday, every summer holiday was was in a field in Reading. Uh, every because both my parents worked there. You know, I, I, it was the crash, and yeah, I spent all my time at the at the club. Loved the Space Space Invaders and uh, Pinball Machine. Um, obviously, I wasn't allowed on it when the club was open. That Lemmy dominated it then. Uh, yeah, we'd get some pocket money and go round to Dark They Were and Golden Eye just by Trident Studios to to buy some uh, comics or books, uh, and then later on Denmark Street, Forbidden Planet. Um, so uh, you know, it was a great area, and it, it wasn't just the marquee just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And you know, I, I can't I can't emphasize. I guess certainly when you go back to that fifties and sixties. Uh, environment how how special that area was compared to the rest of even provincial London or or the rest of the country you know what what a what a magnet um and as as Pete said well before that you know the 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 benefit of proximity and people sort of bumping into each other and and learning from each other um you know you can you can you can just you can just imagine the energy they got from being there Absolutely. Music has moved around London and where it'll be on the west side, it'll be in Camden or it'll be in Shoreditch or it'll be, you know, the sort of like free jazz that's happening in like Campbell and Peckham right now. But Soho had this stronghold and still has with the 100 Club, to be honest. That's uh, the, the last yeah. few standing from that era. Um, you mentioned Lemmy. You've got this brilliant quote at the start of the book, which is the reason I like the marquee was because it was because it was scruffy and a hellhole and your feet stuck to the floor. And that's exactly what a rock and roll club should be like. So, yes, good on you, Lemmy. Um, did you have any duties yourself? Did you get absorbed into the business and end up, you know, running bits, do the cloakroom banana rama, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I used to used to uh, try and design some of the programs and, uh, you know, help with uh, help with mailing out the um, the brochures and uh uh, yeah, obviously at, at, at Reading, um, I was uh, it was involved all, all the time because you couldn't really do anything doing anything else. So um, yeah, you know, many many fond uh, memories, and uh, I, I guess as we ended with that Nirvana gig, that's probably one of the most memorable gigs I've ever I've ever seen, um, uh, and, and such a sad 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 point that it was the last gig they played in the UK before Kurt Cobain died. Yeah, my um, my good friend Jerry Thackeray, who is also known as Everett True, is the man who wheeled Kurt on to the stage. <laughs> I was there. I was there in the crowd. Right. I think it had been very muddy. It used to get very muddy at those festivals. I, I was I was there, Joe, you know, and I, I walked out before Nirvana came on because I didn't want to miss my train, and it's, it's one of my biggest Pete. biggest regrets. <laughs> Luckily, some people I didn't really like Nirvana. I liked um. I liked all the other bands that played that day. It was an amazing, amazing lineup that Sunday. It was a brilliant lineup. And, um, totally up my street as well with things like yeah. youth. Yeah, great stuff. Really, really good. Oh well, reminds me of oh, the, one of my biggest it, musical regrets. It's all right. Nothing happened. Well, uh, sorry, Pete. There's a video. There's a video you can get to watch it, isn't there? But uh, yeah, not quite. Not quite the same. Um, I was lucky enough to be in the light. Myself I myself to do it. <laughs> yeah, what, what, watch the video and, and stand in a bucket of mud. <laughs> that's right recreate the experience amazing the okay. classic story I, I like about about a missed gig is is phil collins because as as robert said he used to come up as a 15 year old and be at front of the mm. queue and sort of jack jack would let him in to sort of put out the chairs because believe it or not at that time there was there was chaired seating in front of the stage uh you right. couldn't imagine that with the sex pistols could you um but um classically you know he, the 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 what would typically happen with the support band would play a set right. and then hen th then the main band, then the support band and then the main band. So they would, they would play four sets overall. And uh, Phil Collins, because he was young, had to get the train back. Uh, and he would normally be able to see the first set of the support and the main the main band. And uh, he would queued up for hours to get into the Hendrix gig. And uh, Hendrix broke with convention. He didn't he didn't play. Uh, until much later on and he just played one set 
and the uh, the sin who were supporting, who by the way were on percentage and were were thought they quids in because uh, they didn't know who was playing that night and thought they weren't going to get much of a cut, and it ended up being one of the busiest gigs ever at the Marquee. They played two support gigs there before Hendrix came on, so Phil Collins saw the sin play twice. <laughs> And missed <laughs> Hendrix, much to his uh, chagrin. Yeah. Still, that's the proto, yes, with the sin. Quick, Chris Squire in there. Um, uh, yeah. Hazel, Hazel's got a question here, which you might have just uh, um, maybe semi-answered there, Nick. To all three, con three contributors, what was the most surprising insight or story, I suppose, that came up with your research into your into your books? Oof. Should we start with? Should we start with? Uh, go on, Robert. Oh. Um. Oh. It's difficult, and I mean, as I said before, you know, we have a sort of a basic knowledge of the market, but once you sort of, you know, dive deep into a subject and research, you, you come up with all this incredible stuff, and it, that was the case with the marquee, you know, and even now, Nick is, Nick is still finding out stuff that, um, you know, did you know this? Did you know that? So, um, it's difficult to know. I mean, I think I think the um, I do like the Rolling Stones lips logo. I think that was a great find. I don't know who. who I think Nick, you found that, didn't you? That it was somewhere out there that it was used, you know, for the first time at that uh, Rolling Stones gig, and now it's an iconic. It's like the Coca-Cola uh, can logo, isn't it? It's just it's a worldwide iconic image, and that was that was first used on the press passes. So uh, we, we, yeah, we, we, I think on almost twice a page, in every couple of pages, there's this amazing fact that um, just you go, what? I didn't know that. So there's lots, there's lots of there's lots of them in the book. Yeah, yeah. There's lots, there's lots of of uh, of moments where you just go, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pete, Pete, Pete yeah. what about for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I guess I mean I was thinking, yeah, that the fact that it, it caused a mining disaster for, for 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 music to appear on Denmark Street, I found that quite um, you know, that that that's quite extraordinary. Um, such a such a you know, such a surprise um and and i just recently sort of discovered um that one of the very very first file sharing companies this is in like i think it's in 1994 someone set up their concept of an electronic jukebox and they located that on on an office on denmark street um and this was yeah this was this was pioneering this was like i think it took something like like eight hours to download one song um and i'm trying to remember if my top of my head the first song downloaded was i can't remember but yeah that yeah the, the 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 first company to try that did that on denmark street and the guy who founded that then later got involved with some of the more successful jukeboxes and and the other one is that a couple of times i interviewed people for who who worked on denmark street in the 90s and they talked about this time when there was this massive police raid and there were people like paragliding down and all this stuff was going on in this building behind and I, was, I assumed they were all like drunk I just like I just didn't understand what they were talking about um and then I was chatting I was telling a friend about this and he was saying oh yeah I remember that there used to be this cafe well it was, wasn't a cafe it was a sort of warehouse on Denmark Place which was a kind of sort of Amsterdam style marijuana um, cannabis cafe and and this did get raided. It was the biggest ever police raid, and they had to shut off all of Denmark Street. And that kind of uncovered this kind of other history of Denmark Street, which is a slightly um, a bit of underworld, basically. There's there, there's a there's there's quite a bit of underworld on Denmark Street um, traditionally. I don't know about now. And that was quite an interesting little diversion away from music, um, and also not always a diversion from music, because music, as we know has its own occasional uh, bits of kind of uh, sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's oh, chicanery. Absolutely. As you were saying, you know, we've got like the, the Crays were there. The Crays were interested in an, managing the, the kinks and they had a lucky escape. Otherwise, they could have been dangled out of, you know, uh, windows by their ankles because they didn't have a hit or something. Thank you for that question, Hazel. I don't know, Nick, have you got something that was a surprising insight that you might have even found out about the club or about your family? Yeah, I'm still finding things out, uh, as, as Robert said. I quite like the quirky stuff, like uh, like Mark, Mark Noffner first met, well, wore a sweatband uh, at a marquee gig because it was so hot and he's sort of never taken it off ever since. Um, I think Alan Johnson, you know, the um, the old Home Secretary, in his, in his uh, autobiography writes about going to gigs at the marquee and seeing seeing the yardbirds so it's it's you know it's a great leveler no matter who you are the great and the good uh i guess i guess you've always you've always can get that excitement from discovering a band or having a shared experience uh which oh, which I, I quite like and, and i guess the 
which Robert found almost it's a pass to parcel when you talk to some some band or some artist or a manager or this, how they met each other or who what that went to go and for, which band went then to form another band and how it all connected I think is fascinating. Well, John John Anderson, of course, was a barman, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. When, when yep. he was asked to join, yes, because they said, oh, there's this guy, he's a barman, and he's got quite a good voice. <laughs> <laughs> it could do something, perhaps, <laughs> someday. Who knows? Who knows? That's great stuff. It really is. Well, I mean, it, it, you talk about the legacy. You were talk, Actually, we mentioned that you're the... Uh, um, uh, in charge of Entech as well, which is um, that. Tell us a bit more about Entech. Well, yeah, that is, there wasn't really a music business. So, um, you know, you're having to invent and solve problems as you go along. So um, specifically around festivals. So, uh, you know, public, you know, those porta trackway, uh, wristbands, all those things we take for granted, lasers, uh, screens, all of them had to be, figured out and, and were debuted at, at one of dad's festivals. Um, and uh, the other thing we don't realise is, of course, amp sound amplification and lighting wasn't really uh, up to snuff, certainly for outdoor events. So the um, famous in that, that 67 um, festival that had been, uh, we got chucked out of Richmond after five years uh, and then a tour of various race courses locally. Um, so at, Windsor which was 66 and uh 67 you um you got effectively the first real rock and roll um festivals and uh that that's where we saw sort of Queen and uh Fleet, Fleetwood Mac um and also the the start of um Entech at the next one because uh the first one kilowatt sound system by Wem was debuted at uh, at sixty seven, and and people thought their eardrums would melt, and and you know it would be the end of the world that you could get to one kilowatt, uh, which seems mad now, um, but it was a uh, it was like the space race really, and then the year after, a guy called Pat Chapman approached my dad and said, well, you know all these lava lamps and this sort of stuff, uh, can I have a go at doing something to make the stage seem a bit more exciting? And uh, dad said, well, okay, we've got a spare where. You know, a bit of room at the back of the marquee, have a tinker there, and and then Entech was born, Entertainment Technicians, and uh, you know, ever since there for fifty four years, it's been uh, obviously was at Reading at the marquee and and been supporting touring acts e ever since. Um, you know, we've just done the world tour of uh, Grillers and uh, supporting Damon with um, with Blur, and Van Morrison is uh, one of our best customers because he's only happy when he's on stage, so he's always touring. We'll probably be doing the uh, Glastonbury other stage this year, um, Formula One. So keeping us busy. So that we keep Just our hand in something. Just a little bit. So another, you know, branch, a long branch still growing from, from the marquee. Uh, Paul Clark says, was the closure of the marquee the end of Soho as music capital? Interesting. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't link it to I don't, I don't think we're self-centered well, yeah, was <laughs> yeah no, to link, link it to uh to, to purely the marquee I think times change don't they and yeah, uh, I think it was dying already wasn't it I think the pub rock the pubs had gone they? the um you know the pubs where you know bands like the madness had been created and and discovered I think they were falling away weren't they so I think because we were saying as well music moves around and it kind of went into different directions Camden has stayed quite a heartland for for some of these these uh these acts as well but yeah things say start, it's it good was, Soho. go on pete well, i can say it's the astoria that really did it for me that was the yeah. really big one and that was part of the whole denmark street thing but that's you know that was the one that really finished off soho as a major music venue i was thinking about uh the story when we were talking about denmark street because obviously you could see it pretty much from there that was my yeah absolute hub and I was so happy when the Elizabeth line halted for a bit because they found a vintage pickle factory in the uh, bowels of it. And I was like, yes, mm. it'll be saved. And it wasn't, it was just momentarily, there was a, that was, uh, that was a strange, uh, strange episode. But yeah, this story was like an absolute hub for me uh, up that end. And um, there were there's still kind best. of interesting clubs and stuff, but the Elizabeth line actually came and wiped out quite a lot of stuff that was along Oxford Street and slightly beyond. Yeah, the Metro so, as well. Yeah, for sure. Plastic people. God, we're going right back to the. Another, there's another book in this yeah. as well. So, well, the uh, story, the story is a funny one because uh, Dad backed um, Jack Jack Barry and uh, 
Jerry Collins, who was also DJ Jerry, Jerry London, set up the, the first gay super club, uh, Bang, which was actually mm-hmm. um, beneath beneath the Astoria. So so we had a few yeah. that, that pie as well, um, as well as uh, supporting Peter Gabriel and setting up the whole Womad. Womad, yeah. music story. Yeah, but that, that's, that's, that's a story for another up. day. <laughs> That is amazing. Anyway, I think we have, I think we've come to the end. Thank you so much for everybody. Stuart also says, uh, fantastic event. I'm feeling more than a little emotional. Someone get Stuart some tissues. Thinking of the brilliant times around the Soho music scene and Wardle Street in particular. So important to me personally. Can't wait to read your books. Bring back the Marquee Club. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you all. I actually say, I think that there's so much stuff that's here. We need a, an exhibition at some point. Is that in the pipeline? There's some there's some talks about that. There's also been quite a bit, always quite a lot of talks about um, uh, documentaries. Believe it or not, one proposal was Johnny Depp wanted to play my dad, <laughs> which which you can't think of someone who's more unlike my dad in terms of. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I definitely want to get some sheet music and uh, get some of those songs that oh, uh, one classic definitely. ones from uh, from Pete was telling us. Why is there not a Soho Music Museum, everybody? Let's put that thought out there and let's get the London mm. Society to help us getting it together. Tim Barron says, brilliant, thank you. We will wrap this up. We had so much to talk about and so little time. It was absolutely fantastic. I'm so honoured to have been asked by the London Society to do this. Thank you so much, too. Um, let's give everyone a little bit of a virtual round of applause here to Nick Pendleton and his family, for that, for Robert, for corralling it all together. Thank you very much. And to Pete for his dedicated work around talking about, about London issues. Issues and lots of really brilliant London um, uh, culture 